All right, open your Bibles, if you will, to the 10th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Um, we're going to start on a series on establishing priorities. Everybody say establishing priorities. Uh, it's easy, it's easy to get out of uh, prioritizing life, uh, putting other things that are less important in front of things that are, that are more important. Now, when we start talking about establishing priorities, we're not saying that certain priorities aren't important. We're just saying they belong in a certain order. Okay? Certain things belong in a certain order. And uh, <clears throat> we'll deal with the top five priorities of life. And in doing so, again, we're not negating the importance of one or saying um, uh, that you shouldn't attend to certain ones. We're just saying what order they should be coming in in your, in your establishment of those things. Also, some of these things that we'll deal with, you may not, they may not apply to you. You may not be married. You may not have children. But you know, in that, understand, you don't replace those priorities with something. Because you might get married and might have children. And then you don't, you don't, you just, you just keep those slots open. They're, they're, they're empty slots. And for future reference. Amen. So let's read from Luke chapter 10. We'll start in verse 40. We'll read down through verse 42. And um, actually, we'll just back at verse 38. How about that? Now, it came to pass, as they went, they entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him, now we're in reference to Jesus, into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about with much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me alone to serve alone. Bid her, therefore, that she help me. Now, obviously, there's a little attitude going on here. I'm over here busting my back in, serving everybody, and there, there's Mary there sitting at his feet, just doing nothing, and Jesus don't even care. Now, let me tell you something. When you, I'm just going to tell you right up front. When you get priorities out of order, you'll start getting anger and resentment toward God. That one ever big. I said, when you get priorities out of line, you, well, or maybe not you necessarily, you definitely will. Let me put it like this. You open the door for anger and resentment toward God. Now, here is Jesus, the epitome of love, walking and doing all he's doing, shows up at her house. She's honored to have him there. She's busy about serving, but her sister's not doing something. And she gets irritated. So much she accuses the Lord of not having concern about her state. Didn't she? Do you not care that she's left me to serve alone? Amen? Now, and here was her solution. See how I had to fix. Tell you something else. When you get them out of order, you think you have all the answers. Bid her to come help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, I bet she didn't like this answer to start with, Martha, Martha, thou art careful. Now, that means anxious or worried, you know, burdened and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. Now, so this passage gives us insight into the lives of two very different people. Both, both of them loved the Lord, wanted to serve and please Him, but in different ways. The problem with Martha is that she, in this passage, she has misplaced priorities. When an individual has misplaced uh, priorities, they will make decisions based upon wrong information. In Martha's case, she thought that Jesus would be pleased with her serving, when in fact Mary had chosen the good part. What, uh, what we want to do is to choose that good part for our lives, then we will make good decisions, because that good part is based upon the Word being first place in our lives. Um, under, notice all, not only that, she became angry or bitter or resentful. She, was, she knew she had the answer. And that was for, some, for somebody else to do what they were doing. You got to do it like I'm doing it. I'm going to tell you right now, I've met too many people that have misplaced priorities. And they get, they get resentful. And it's always towards leadership. In this case, Jesus. 
They get resentful towards leadership and those who have authority in their life because they think that they're, the, you know, and it's all, if you really go to measure, it's only because they've got misplaced priorities. And they start getting answers that aren't biblical, but they, they think they are. I mean, think of the audacity. Are you here? I mean, this is just, this is just pure, unadulterated, brassy audacity to tell Jesus that you don't care and make Mary get up and come help me. Hello? How many of you would tell Jesus like that, talk to Jesus like that? No one's not talking about ta exercising authority or exercising boldness and intercession. We're talking about somebody who's disgruntled. Now, now, can I say something else here while I'm talking to you? Thank you. I think I got that one go ahead, Pastor. Don't you listen to disgruntled Christians. Amen. They'll come to you like they got all the answers. They got all the insight. The Lord talks to them more than he talks to, to the, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Hello? I mean, they have daily conversations with the Lord that are so deep and so revealing and so astounding, you would think that they just don't, they don't even have a body. They just live in the spirit realm. And they, you know, listen, I believe we can have communication and con consistent communication with God. But I always get interested how that when people start saying, the Lord told me and the Lord showed me and the Lord said and the Lord did this, how, how much of the time it doesn't line up with the Word. <laughs> Hello? That went over big. If the Lord told you and it don't line up with the Word, the Lord didn't tell you. Amen. Hello? That's real simple. That's not complicated. Are you here? You know, you don't have to have a, 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 a master's or a doctorate in theological studies or in theology, technically we in theology, wouldn't mean theology, but, or biblical studies, or the Greek, Hebrew, and the Chaldean, or the Aramaic. You don't have to have a, any letters behind your name to figure out that if the, if the Lord tells you, quote, the Lord tells you something, but it doesn't line up with the written word, it wasn't the Lord. Or put it like this, it wasn't the Lord of hosts. It may have been the Lord of the flies, but it wasn't the Lord of the host. Amen. When the Lord showed me I don't have to do this, and the Lord showed me I don't have to do that. And I'm just always amazed at how when people get their priorities out of line and they get, in, and they get into the wrong, that wrong thing, that they get disgruntled and then they, they get angry at authority, either with God or God's representative. And it's easier to get mad. And so a lot, now a lot of people just get mad at the representative, usually the pastor. Amen. They don't get mad at traveling speakers. They get mad at the pastor. And they, and they come up and they have solutions. The Lord, well, the Lord showed me. Amazing. The Lord showed you, showed you how for me to run the church. He didn't show you where to hook up and do something. That went over big. What am I saying? When you have misplaced priorities, you can begin to act like Martha. That is, you get a, a, a resentfulness, and people who are resentful will tell people off that they would no, not normally tell off. They'll say things to people they wouldn't normally say. Hallelujah. All right. <laughs> That's my fake choir back there. They were listening. <laughs> Amen. 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 So let's talk about getting these priorities straight. A lot of people, and now let me say this, a lot of people when they get here and they get their misplaced priorities, then they are wide open game for excessive doctrines and teachings. And I can tell you the people who run off after, after this extreme teaching message, that are saying, I don't have to tithe, I don't have to go to church, I don't have to obey, I don't have to submit, I don't have to give, I don't have to do this, or all people with misplaced priorities. They're putting a doctrine above the Word. They're putting a particular doctrine higher than the whole counsel of the Word of God. So we have to come back and establish in our life priorities. These are, these are uh, prior to, prioritized principles that we need to live by and consistently stay there. You can't avoid them or avert them. You can't uh, circumvent them. And you can't have special revelation that absolves you from them. I just get amazed at people who get revelations that absolve them or abdicate them from their responsibility to do the, what the Word of God says do. I never, get, I never cease to be amazed. I mean, I see it all the time. 
And, and I'm going to tell you, there are people who are floundering in the wrong churches and the wrong, hooked up with the wrong ministry. Listen, it's not that they're bad churches or bad ministry. They're not supposed to be there. They're supposed to be somewhere else. God sent them somewhere else, and they were supposed to be somewhere else. And they, they got uh, all this resentment and anger and all this mess built up on the inside of them, and they got misplaced priorities and all this kind of stuff, and they're now telling the Lord what they're going to do instead of listening to, tell him, listening to him tell them what to do. Now, first of all, uh, Lord means bread provider, or, he, you know, once the clay place bread provider, but in, in other ways, uh, he's your master. He, you are his servant. You serve the Lord. Well, I'm a son of God. Yeah, but you're still sub subservient to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the H-E-A-D, head of the church. Amen. And if you don't think so, wait till you die and go to heaven. See who's running things. Hallelujah. All right, anyway. Y'all here, y'all going home. All right. Priorities. Prior, listen, these priorities are lifetime commitments. These are not things you do because they're convenient. Amen? And we live, listen, America is the convenient society. We don't even want to cook. But listen, we don't even want to make instant mashed potatoes anymore. They're now bagging them up. You undo the top, stick in the microwave for a little while, pull them out, and you didn't do anything except tear the top off the bag. And if you can find a way not to have to do that, you do that. Hello. We got generations who do not know that mashed potatoes, the ones in the back, instant or the ones that, that are already made in the microwave, came from a potato that was peeled and boiled and mashed, drained and mashed. Butter and milk and salt added to it. They don't know that. They think it came from a bag. <laughs> Hello. They don't know that vegetables actually came out of a garden or a farm. I thought they came out of a can. Hello. We are so convenience-minded that we don't realize that, that fried chicken came from a chicken. <laughs> We thought I came from Zaxby's or McDonald's, I mean Bojangles or something. We are so conditioned on convenience that we have, we've been so trained this way that now we approach God this way. But let me say, when establishing the priorities of life, we are talking about commitment. Not his commitment to you, your commitment to him. He's demonstrated his commitment to you. What do you mean, John 3, 16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God has demonstrated his commitment to you by sending Jesus and allowing him to become the sin substitute and identifying with you and, and, and paying the price for your sin, being raised up again and seated at his right hand where he ever lives to make intercession for you. God has demonstrated his commitment to you. It's called grace. That is the demonstration of God's commitment to you. But there is another thing called commitment by you to him. And you demonstrate that commitment through the life of faith, and the life of faith is based on having certain priorities in, in order. Amen? Number one, you have to have a, a lifetime forever eternal commitment to God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ as your number one priority of life. Nothing gets to take that place. Your wife, your kids, the dog, your job. Now we're not talking about your church. Nothing takes the place of your personal intimate relationship with God the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That is your number one. Say, that is my number one priority of life. Amen. Now listen, there are other priorities you have to have, but this is the number one one. The number one one. Yeah, I guess that works. This is the numero uno one. All right? Exodus 20. Uh, 20. The Exodus 20, the, the, um, the chapter 20. 
We're going to look over there. That's Old Testament. I don't care. Still Bible. Let me say this. Unless the New Testament dealt with it, yeah. it's still relevant. We mean we dealt with it. Well, the Levitical law and its ordinances have been done away because the New Testament says they have been. There's nothing in the New Testament said that that um, that tithing's been done away. It's under the law, yeah, but it was before the law. It was under Abraham. So tithing showed up. So tithing was just dealt with in specificity in the in the law. In other words, you were, and have me know this. If we were if we we're following the the law form of tithing, all your tithe would come to me personally. Then we would take up offers to run the church. Now, that's how it was done in, in the law. We don't do it that way. We, we're following the principles of, of the tithe being brought to, to um, uh, like from Abraham gave tithe to Melchizedek, the priest, and it was used to, to fund and work the kingdom of God. And then in the New Testament, the money was brought to the church to take care of the church and, and, and take care of the ministers. You know, the Bible tells us that. But under the, under the Levitical law, the tithe was given, every, every penny, every whatever of the tithe was given to the priest. And then they had offerings to run everything else. Hello? Well, we don't practice that. I, and I know, I knew a pastor who did. He'd say, this is the tithe, this goes to me. And then he'd take up another offer and say, this is for running the church. Yeah, I, I, knew, I knew one that did that. And he lived good, too. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Well, but if the, if the, and let me, I was just making this statement that the New Testament doesn't deal with that not being a biblical principle anymore or a New Testament principle, it's still enforced. Because I'll tell you what, everybody, everybody I know that's under the New Testament wants the blessing of Abraham. That's Old Testament. No, we just, we just, if, the, if, if there's things that are written that it's not dealt with, okay, it's still enforced. Now, people say, well, Jesus didn't say anything about homosexuality. He didn't have to. He didn't undo the things concerning that. Amen. He didn't undo, you know, uh, being married to the same person all the time. He didn't undo a lot of things. Now, he, now, now Peter had the vision, undid the unclean animals. Yeah. Now, it was a spiritual application there, but it was also a natural application. Understand? Can you imagine back when, they first, when the laws were first giving, dealing with certain, certain what we call unclean pork and stuff? You know, if you don't cook pork to a certain temperature, it's, it's, it can be dangerous. Scavengers can be, you know, shrimp. How many like shrimp? Yeah. They're scavengers. You couldn't eat that under the law. Catfish. Some of you love, you love fried catfish. They are scavengers. Hello? That was just a, all a side journey there. If you do not have your priorities in order, you will not make good decisions. You will, you will allow an out-of-place priority to force you into a wrong decision, like leaving the, leaving the church you're supposed to be in, leaving your wife or husband. Hello? Anyway. All right. God is your number one priority. Exodus chapter 20. Um, and he starts out in verse 1 and 2. It says this, I, I, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. The God of cycling, the God of golf, the God of the beach, the God of the mountains, the God of sleep, the God of television. Am I done yet? No. The God of restaurant. You shall have no... I get up on Sunday mornings and start church and I see people out cycling. They can see them out on the golf course. I see them... Oh, they need recreation. Not before God. Not before God. There's a lot of people just sleeping in because they're sleepy. Oh, I'm going to tell you what. Everybody in here can be sleepy. This morning, man, it was cloudy and cool. Yeah. I mean, it's like, pull the blankie, not even blanket, your blankie. <laughs> pull your blankie up. Tuck it in around your neck. Hallelujah. I mean, and, and, and snooze for another 10 hours. There's nobody out cutting grass. 
Nobody make any noise except the neighbor's little yippy doll they let out in the mornings. Yip, 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 yip. The God of hunting. I think Nathan was going to shoot the neighbor's dog, but I saw him doing this, and I made me think of the God of hunting. I'm amazed at the people who can get up at five and be in the woods before six who can't get to church. Now, Joe loves to hunt. Joe's always here. I don't have, you know, Nathan's always here. I'm just saying, there are people who can get up and go hunting and go to work. Go hunt for two hours and still make work and can't get to church. I can't have a relationship with God. I'm telling you, you cannot have another God before God. Are y'all here? You're going home. <coughs> God said, I am God. You shall have no other gods before me. And it's easy. I remember one time somebody was telling me that they, 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 they had a, um, a sense that there was a demon in their house. It was, a, it was a little, you know, just, and they kept looking around, looking around, looking around, looking around. And, and one day they picked up the television remote and the Spirit of God said, there it is. <laughs> the God, the demon television. Now, we're going up Pentecostal back in the 50s when television was starting to get big. You hear sermons preached on the one-eyed devil. I wouldn't have one of them one-eyed devils in my house. They would sit in their closets and watch it. So nobody from the church would ride by and see the light from the television. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. No, God has to be your number one priority in life. God says, I, listen, I, God says he's a jealous God. He will have no other gods before him. Amen. And so we have to understand, you can't put, any, you can't put your wife in God's slot. In other words, you'll do anything for your wife, but you won't do anything for God. You'll do anything for your husband, but you won't do anything for God. Hello? You'll lasso the moon. Y'all remember that? What, what movie was that? It's a Wonderful Life. George Bailey's going to lasso the moon for her. You know, for, 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 for a girl, but you won't walk across the street for God. We have to put God for us. Amen. The psalmist said in Psalm 119, verse 164, seven times a day do I praise thee because of thy righteous judgments. Psalm 27, 8 says, when thou saidest, seek my face, my heart said unto thee, thy face, Lord, will I seek. That's Psalm 27, 8. Think about that. God says, seek my face, and my heart said, I'll seek your face. We have lost a sensitivity to the still small voice of God communing with us and fellowshipping with us and requesting of us and us listening. Sometimes that's because we've got the priority of what's in it for me up front. Now, if you'll smile real big and give the bobblehead look, nobody will know I'm preaching at you. All right? God said, seek my face. And my heart said, there, there. my heart said, thy face will I seek, Lord. God has to be that number one part of your life. Your, 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 your heart is to be consumed. Like the psalmist said, as the deer panteth after the water, so my soul longeth for thee. Amen? Amen? So will my heart pant after thee. The Psalm 63, 1 says, O oh, oh God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where there no water is. To see thy power and glory so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary because thy loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise thee. Now, it's important that we have a heart for God, for the things of God. This isn't a rebuke sermon. This is a prior, this is an adjust your priority sermon. Amen. Amen. This isn't to tell you're a dirty, rotten scoundrel. That was Steve Martin. All right. We're talking about having a heart for God. And let, let me add this. During times of great difficulty, people go one or two ways. Some are, are, are go toward God and some, uh, some withdraw from God. Some will withdraw from God. Others will pant after God. You cannot permit. 
And you cannot allow circumstances of life to become a divider between you and your relationship with your heavenly father. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. You have to say, You are my God. I will seek you. Amen. I will, my, my soul thirsteth for thee, my flesh longeth for thee as in a dry and thirsty land. And then, what for? To see thy power and thy glory. And listen, so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. Well, how, well, how did he see him in the sanctuary? <coughs> in, in, in spiritual matters, and in, in, in not, in, maybe not in vision form, but in spiritual relationship, you see God. Now, not necessarily see God. You get perceptions of God. Amen. You have an understanding of God. Now, you could have a, a vision. But I believe here that Psalmist was talking about not necessarily a vision as much as he was talking about that in his fellowship with God, he saw in his spiritual eye, as it were, the nature and the character of God. And so he said he longed to see his power and the glory as he had seen in the sanctuary. In other words, because he had been longing for him and thirsting for him and spending time with him, he longed to see it manifest what he had seen in his fellowship. Amen. Well, see, he couldn't long to see the power and the glory until after he had longed to see him in the sanctuary. He had spent the time with the Father. He had been in his presence. Amen. He had come out of the presence of God with the glory instead of coming out of the circumstance in the smoke. I remember the story of the three Hebrew children who would not bow their knee. Amen. And they threw them and they heated up the fire, uh, the furnace seven times hotter than normal, so hot that the, that the guards who threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fire were killed by the heat. So we're not talking about fire walking in Jamaica, going across coals with demons under your feet. The demons under my feet. Woo! Ah! Oh. You know, that's mind over matter. That's devils under your feet. You're giving yourself over to demonic forces. We're not talking about that. We're talking about a, fire, a furnace so hot that the people who threw the guys in were killed by the heat. That's hot. I said, that's hot. Anybody ever been around a hot fire? You had to back away just because the heat, it'd be just a fire. This is a, this is a campfire. Yeah, Nathan builds fires so hot you can't hardly get next to them. You send them at 15 feet away. I mean, our campfires are bonfires for two. Yes, sir. I mean, it flames up to here. You're like, get the fire extinguishers out and be ready. Amen. Hallelujah. But listen, he said, because thy loving kindness is better than life. I can tell you. Uh, and then he said, therefore my lips shall praise thee. His praise came out of thirsting and hungering for God. See, well, a lot of times we spend a lot of time trying to get people to praise and to magnify God by faith, which is okay. But I'll tell you what, it's a whole lot more fun to praise and magnify God because you've been with him and you're, and you're just flipped out about how good he is and how wonderful he is. Amen? I mean, you know, man, when you found, when you found your wife, or you, you know, you found that girl that you fell in love with. I mean, it was one thing to see her and be attracted to her and go, ooh, I like her. I think she's something else. It was another thing to get to know her and to fall in love. And now, long, now it's no longer that you're attracted to her, you're falling in love. Why y'all look at me like that? Like, I don't know what you're talking about. You better. And man, that's a real good opportunity for you to be, uh, earn some brownie points right here. Instead of looking dumbfounded out like you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, Lloyd's got, yeah, you're right, Pastor. Go, go ahead. On. All right. I even got Lloyd on the floor here. Look at that. You got some of y'all like, like a frog on the bump of a log. Ribbit, ribbit. See, the attraction was one thing. A lot of people are attracted to what God can do. 
And they'll sing songs about how great he is and what he can do. But I am telling you, the psalmist found the secret of hungering and thirsting for God and being in his presence. And because he found out his loving kindness was better than life, by spending time with him, his lips praised God. <laughs> There is a difference between praising God because you're, you know, well, it's in the Bible, I'm going to do it, and because you've had an experience in his presence that says, what he says in his word, I have, I have had the, uh, the Greek word is epinosis, which is a clear, precise, exact, experiential knowledge of something. You had an epinosis, you have an epinosis of God. You've experienced. You haven't just heard about it. You haven't read about it, and you're stepping out by faith on this. I believe in stepping out by faith. But I am telling you, if you're going to go to higher levels, you're going to have to experience things because you did what the Bible said, and that was hunger and thirst after God, and got into His presence, and had fellowship with Him, and came to know Him. So you can get married to somebody and stay married to them and never fall in love or never, uh, I mean, you can put up with them, I guess. Now, that's not, that's not life. Amen? It needs to be love. Amen. All right, there you go. Right through King of Kings, next King of Kings. Hallelujah. All right, anyway. So the psalmist goes on, in Matthew, and I'm sorry, in Matthew, look over here in Matthew 22. We're not going to get far this morning. As far as my notes are concerned, we're going to get far. It's not. Matthew 22, verse, oh, we'll look down, verse 30. Four. But when the Sad Pharisees had heard he, that he put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? See, people are always trying to get you pinned down on stuff. And the Lord said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, what did Jesus say? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength, or mind? Your love for God will be based on your time spent with Him. Amen. Amen. You're going to have to spend time with God. Why? Because the depth of love deepens with knowledge. You could look at somebody, man, I'm in, you know, so I'm, this is love at first sight. I'm in love with her. Until you get to know her. Then you might find out she's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Who uh hummed out here? <laughs> now, oh. Might find out they're a schizophrenic, bipolar lunatic. <laughs> Ain't that right? Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah. But she was pretty. And we talked, we had lots of good conversations to start with. Then you found out they're crazy. Okay. I guess y'all figured out Nate that dated somebody that was crazy. <laughs> anyway. I mean, basket case. Anyway. You have to have. It. Knowledge. You have to spend time getting to know God. Not just as your rescuer from hell, but as the glory and the lifter of your head. Amen. A lot of people just go and get and go through the fire go through the fire department part of heaven. You know, they came in and rescued you from hell. And thank God you're not going there. I think hell is not a place you want to go to. One preacher I heard a preacher one time said this, man, you know, a lot of people are just going through hell. And the, and the thing is, when you're going through hell, don't stop. Some Christians get out and set up a picnic lunch and hang out there. No, you just don't stop. You keep going. Amen? amen. I said amen. But, you know, God is more than your rescue from hell. He's the glory and the lifter of your head. Hallelujah. 
He's your heavenly father. He's your Jehovah Jireh. You're Jehovah Rapha. You're Jehovah Nisi. You're Jehovah Tasitkenu. Amen? You're Jehovah M. Kadesh. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He is your great God Almighty. Hallelujah. Amen? He's your Jehovah Shalom. Praise God. He's your all in all. Hallelujah. Amen? Glory to God. He's just not the fire chief. He is your all in all. Glory to God. But see, so many people just get out of get get their get out of hell free card and stop there and don't come to know the father as a matter of fact they've got an opinion of him that if they, if they do something he doesn't like he'll just put them right back where he found them hello I said hello he's not interested in putting you back where you found he found you he sent Jesus to rescue you out of your destruction. But listen to this. The Bible says this. And in one place it talks about he, he delivers from our destructions. But also another place it says, and he has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So once you've been rescued, it goes beyond the rescue. It goes to the place of, of, of abiding fellowship, amen, and, and relationship with the Father. And that's what God is looking for. That has to be your number one priority in life is to have that fellowship and relationship with God the Father. And let me say this. You've got to go beyond Jesus. Jesus came to restore you to the Father, not to himself. That went over. Amen. I know 90% of, about 90 of Christians I know are more comfortable with their relationship with Jesus than they are with the Father. Why? Because he, he's the one who died on the cross. He paid the price. But he did that so he could present us to the Father. Remember this? And over in Romans it says this, and he, the, he is descended first into the lower parts of the earth, also ascended up on high, and he says this, that he might lead captivity captive. What did he do? He led the captives who were in Abraham's bosom. He led them what for? To present them to the Father. Your number one priority is to have a personal intimate relationship and fellowship with God the Father through Jesus Christ. You fellowship with the Father. What did Jesus say? Y'all remember? In his great intercessory prayer, he was talking to the church. He said, in that day you will ask me nothing, but whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Jesus was always working towards bringing people to the Father. Amen? If I be lifted up, I'll, lift, I'll draw all men into me. But that was so he could lead them and direct them to the Father. Read it and study it. He was always pointing them to the Father. That's your number one priority of life. That intimate relationship with God the Father. Amen. Let me say this. Your kids don't come before God. Club ball don't come before God. Club soccer, club baseball, club golf, club swimming, club cheerleading, club uh, volleyball, uh, club chorus, club whatever they come up with next. It's club something. And it's all year long. When it's not playing in the regular school seasons, it's going on all other seasons the rest of the year. They don't come. Listen, you're not doing your kids a justice to keep them out of church to serve the God of soccer or the God of baseball or the God of softball, or the God of volleyball, or the God of cheerleading, or the God of swimming, or the God of whatever else it is that, that somebody's blowing wind up your skirt and told you your kids had to have in order to be able to uh, make it to college. I've, I've known people who spent probably as much money on trying to get their kids a college scholarship or more than it cost, cost the, the, more than the scholarship they got. Hello? I know people who it's been year round, year round, year round, year round, missing church, missing, teaching their kids that God is first in order to get them uh, ahead in a sport, only to find out once they got up to the next level, they won't anything or they washed out. And the years they need to be teaching them by exact precept and example that a, wa a walk with God is more important than anything. You taught them that the God of sports was greater than the God of heaven. That went ever big, I know. 
I don't. I, I think it's fine for children to be involved. My son, my kids have all been involved in sports. We just wouldn't do club. And in cases we had to pay a price for it because there's coaches now. You got coaches who can't coach. They're just managers, and they just, you know, if you haven't been playing on some club team, they can just bring you in and not have to do anything except put you in the position. They don't know what to do with you, so they don't do anything with you. Or they make it known, basically they're making it known that if you don't play on my club team and pay me $1,000 for one season, you're not going to get to play when it comes to school. That kind of stuff. It's all, all that's going on. Let me say something. There's nothing more important than demonstrating to your children and to your family as a leader of your household, wherever you are, that woman or man, if you're a single household and you're a woman, you've got you've got to play that role. That a walk with God is more important than anything. Amen. It comes first. I didn't say don't do stuff with your kids. Listen, I have driven hundreds of miles to sit in the bleachers to watch my kids play something. Probably more than, probably thousands, a couple thousand, three or four thousand miles to, over, over the years to watch them, just to go, to be there, to be there, to be there for them when, they, when they're playing their sport. But it never came at the expense of serving God. There are times I wanted to be there, I couldn't because we had a church event or something, and uh, usually that's the night that something happened. I had to be at some, some, I think, one night they hit a home run uh, one year, and I had just left because I had to get back for church for something. There was something going on in the church that I had to get back, and I had to be there, and I get a phone call and I'm like, he just hit a home run. Thank you, Nathan, for hitting the home run while I wasn't there. You know, people, actually, parents got to the point, parents started saying, why don't you just stay away? <laughs> We had our Raymond District meeting this year on, on, in May, and uh, and I and I leave. Nathan had gone 0 for 2 the first two at bats. Uh, he had, it was senior night. He was starting on senior night, and he had gone 0 for 2. He had hit the ball, but he just hadn't got a hit. And I leave, and I get a text message after right in the middle of the meeting. Nathan just drilled two stand-up doubles while you were gone. <laughs> Great, I missed that one. But uh, you know, I was there. But you know what? Never at the expense of serving God. God came first. Amen. I said amen. amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We're excited. Now listen, it's it kind of kind of funny thing to tell on that story. Nathan's playing college baseball. His, his high school coach wouldn't even hardly give him a chance to see the dug, outside the dugout, and he's, he's going to be on the team for college because his hitting coach talked to the coach, and the coach came saw him play twice. He didn't know he'd be there twice. We saw him one time. We didn't know he'd come see him play twice. And uh, they, they told him, we saw him the other, at, at campus the other day. The coach said, well, we've been expecting you. We need outfielders. <laughs> so, Nathan's excited, aren't you, buddy? Yeah. But you know what? We didn't do it at expense of God. I know people who all they've done is play summer ball, winter ball, fall ball, school ball, play tournament ball during school ball. And they can't, even, they can't make, they're, they're, they're quitting college because they can't get to play. And they all learned that baseball is more important than God because they were. I had parents tell me, well, we have a little chapel before the games. And I just kept my mouth shut. I'm going to let Mr. Non committed to the things of God give my chapel to my son and teach them the ways of God when they're not even following them themselves. And usually those kind of chapels go like this, you know, you know, you have to overcome adversity in life and some kind of pep talky thing. Kids don't need pep talk. They need an example of a parent that God's number one. Amen? I kind of shifted off my priorities there and kind of brought the kids in. But you know what? You've got to have a number one priority of God first to be able to do other priorities in life. You can't properly love your wife and keep her priority in the right place if you don't love God. Well, I know many good husbands who've been good husbands that didn't love God. They didn't lead, give the spiritual leadership their families needed. That's an imperative in this day and hour. I mean, I saw people at the Democratic Convention with post boards on it said, if Jesus comes back, kill him again. Yeah, oh yeah. God is your enemy. That one ever big. If Jesus comes back, kill him again. Where did these pinheads get it? Somebody didn't bring them up right. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. 
they weren't trained in the right ways. They didn't, they didn't have God as an, a living God in their household. Not the God of religion, but the God of heaven who is alive. Amen? Praise the Lord. So the number one priority of life is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and strength and, and, and your neighbor as yourself. Amen? Um, let's look over in John 21. We're going to finish right here with this passage. Tonight we'll pick up with loving your spouse. I shouldn't have said that. I should have said how to get rich quick in 30 easy steps. <laughs> let's get everybody back tonight. But we're, tonight we're going, to take, we're going to talk about the second priority of life is your spouse. But right here, this last verse for this morning, John 21. Let's look over there. So when they, now verse 15, so when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, Lovest thou more than these? And he said unto him, Yes, Lord, you'll know that I love you. He said unto him, Feed my lambs. He said unto him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And he, and he saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love you. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he had said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he had said unto the Lord, uh, You knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said unto him, Feed my lambs. There's a real interesting thing here. Part of a demonstration of our love for God is to do His will. Jesus was telling Peter, asking him, do you love me? He said, yeah. He said, then do this. We can all get together and say, I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice to worship you, O oh, my soul, rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you hear. Okay, we can sing that. But God says, do what I tell you to do. It's easy to come to church and sing a love song to the Lord. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. Woo, yeah! And I'll kind of do the charismatic whatever. We can all do that. But Jesus did not say, Simon, son of Barjona, do you love me? He said, yes. And the Lord said, sing me a worship song. He said, do what you're supposed to do. Fulfill my will. <clears throat> now, I'm not knocking worship songs. You understand that. What I'm trying to say is we always want to revert to the easy and let that take the place of the required. Amen. It's easy to go and say, I, the Lord knows my heart. I love the Lord. Well, he said, if you love me, do what I told you to do. Amen. That's the hard part. Why? Because you find out real quick how many people really mean it or they're just spouting words. Hello. There are people who want to advocate their, their, their responsibilities by doing what they want to do and not what God said. If you love the Lord, you will obey the Lord. I'm under grace. Oh, just shut up. I'm sorry. Just shut up that stupid stuff. That does not release you from the responsibility of obeying God. Amen. His grace empowers you to obey Him. It doesn't release you from the responsibility of obeying Him. I shouldn't have said shut up. Okay? I'm sorry. Femme of the <laughs> What's that mean? Shut up in French. <laughs> sorry. Anyway, at least I didn't say to a bet. Isn't that right, Nathan? What's that? We just, it means you're stupid. But anyway, I didn't say that to anybody. We are to obey God and do what God said, and it is a demonstration that we love Him. God demonstrated His love for us and that He sent Jesus. Even while we were sinners, He sent Jesus. Now we are required, according to Jesus, to obey Him. 
as a demonstration of our love. What I got, y'all got, got like the first church of the frozen chosen out there this morning. Do I need to pray for toes? Some of y'all think I heard three of you holler ouch this morning. I know I heard two help me Jesuses. If you were just thinking it. God said, Jesus basically told Peter, if you love me, do what I told you to do. Well, I don't like that. I love that. He knows my heart. Look at what Peter said. Isn't that what Peter says? Peter was grieved because he had said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he had said unto the Lord, Lord, thou knowest I listen to me, thou knowest all things, and thou knowest I love thee. And Jesus said unto him again, Feed my sheep. Isn't that the same thing? The Lord just the Lord knows my heart. That's what Peter said. Peter said, You know everything. You know I love you. And Jesus said, Well then, feed my sheep. Yeah, I know it, but do something about it. Y'all, did I lose y'all somewhere along the way? Did y'all think that the, 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 the first church of the frozen will get to the cafeteria before you? I'm telling you, they're already in line and they're sitting down already. There'll be plenty of time for you to get over there. But y'all, y'all understand what I'm saying? You, you can't use cop outs like, well, the Lord knows my heart. That's what Peter said. And the Lord still said to him, feed my sheep. Jesus is letting us know that in having a prioritized relationship with God, that obedience is a demonstration of your love for him. What does obedience do? Obedience demands you do stuff that you don't mean necessarily fleshly want to do. Your flesh may not want to get up and go to church. Your flesh may not want to read your Bible. Your flesh may not want to go to a meeting. Your flesh may not want to come out for prayer on Thursday nights to pray for our nation. Your prayer may not, your flesh may not want to come out tonight and be in church service. There may be all kinds of things your flesh doesn't want to do. But obedience dictates it. You had the willing. You remember, remember this, Isaiah 119. I know people always try to revert and say, it's amazing to me how many people want to quote the Old Testament when it's to their benefit and discount it when it's not. Isaiah 119 says, if you be willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. Those, those are biblical principles. That was not in the law. That was a prophet. That's not in the Levitical law. That's a prophet speaking. By the Spirit of God. If you be willing and be obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. Amen. Well, Paul said things. He said, you know, you reap what you said. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall they also reap. And you know, I was just talking about spiritual things. He goes on saying, if you reap to the flesh, if you sow to the flesh, you'll reap of the flesh corruption. If you sow to the Spirit, you'll reap of the Spirit life, uh, life eternal. It's basically telling you that wherever you sow is how you're going to reap. But if you be willing and obedient. Obedience. Can I say this? And you not take it wrong? If you love God, you want to obey God. Amen. You want to please God and honor God. Amen. You want to be a compliant child. You don't want Dobson writing a book about you. Oh, he already has. The strong will child. Amen? Well, I, I don't think I have to do what God said. I want to do it my way. Some, somebody I've heard recently, they're, they're, they're out in a Bible school somewhere, and um, they, they and other people came from a church, and, and this, guy's not, this guy's just doing some crazy stuff. So the pastor, one of the, one of the people from the, that's out there called the pastor, said, you need to talk to him, he's just doing this stuff. The pastor called him, talked to him, said, you need to straighten up, you need to get your act together. And you know, as your pastor, I'm telling you, you need to do this, this, and this. He said, I don't have to listen to him anymore, he's not my pastor. There's a lot of people treat God that way. I don't have to, I, I'm not going to hell. I'm in the grace. I'm eternally saved. I'm, I, I, got, I, can't, I can't ever lose my salvation. I don't have to listen to God anymore. Why don't you tell him that? Why don't you just call God up and tell him that? I don't have to listen to you anymore. See how that goes over. Let me say this. If you love God, you want to honor God. And you want to please him. And you will because of your love for him, obey him. That's part of putting him first. Doing what he said, do. 
Can I get a grunt? How many are here today? All right. I think three of you don't know that you're here. You are here. Amen. Let's put God first. Let's love the Lord with all of our heart and soul and strength. Now, listen, I'm not talking about natural effort. I'm talking about doing things in accordance with the Word of God and living that way and having God for having a place of prioritization that God comes first. It doesn't mean you don't do other things in life. And we're going to cover those other th some of these other things. It doesn't mean we negate them. It just means in the list of priorities, he's first. You prioritize things. Amen? I mean, if your house is dirty and you've got to wash clothes and clean the kitchen and take out the garbage and, and, and sweep out the garage and make up the beds, you don't, leave, you don't do one of them and say, well, this is the most important and do it, which usually would be something like either take out the garbage or clean the kitchen because that's where bugs and stuff can come in your house at. That may be the top priority, but it don't mean you negate the others. They still need to be done. All right? God's just first because you don't want the bugs of life in you. You don't want the cockroaches of, the wor of, of worldly contamination in your spiritual house. I got, I got people on that one. Nobody, like, nobody likes a cockroach. They're just, nobody likes a cockroach. I mean, even the, the Hispanics made up a song. La cockroach, la cockroach, cha -cha -cha. Anyway, why? I don't know. All right. Praise the Lord. All right. Praise God. Let's all stand up. Listen, this is not a Holy Ghost run around the room type teaching. This usually is a, would he ever shut up and go to something else that's more exciting teaching? But I can tell you, if you don't get your priorities right, you won't be able to shout long on the other stuff. Unless you're Katie. <laughs> and she's, she's, she's gone, man. Hallelujah. It's a Pentecostal baby. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Turn around. Now, does anybody need any prayer for anything? We need, anybody need to be restored, healed, saved, baptized in the Holy Ghost? Anybody? All right. Praise God. Amen. If you're watching by internet, we encourage you to, to uh, contact our, our ministry through www.fbc.org. You can email us. We'd love to pray with you. And uh, we, we can even have somebody call you and pray with you and, um, and just and lead you to the Lord. Get you filled with the Holy Ghost. Pray for your healing. What we just love to minister to you. So go to our website and check those things out. Also, there's an online giving tab. If you want to join us and support us in our ministry, we'd love to have you do that. Until we meet again, remember that this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith.